So today uh, we're looking at one Corinthians. We missed last class, no? October second. Okay, seems like a long time. So yeah. So we look at uh, uh, we, la last class. We looked at um, chapters thirteen, right? Twelve and thirteen, and we addressed the whole thing of um, gifts and also the place of love um, in the usage of the gifts and the importance of it. Right, and uh, we understand that uh, the whole aspect of gifts is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, meaning expression of the Holy Spirit, and therefore uh, the the Bible, uh, you know, in one Corinthians states, Paul writes about the importance of love in it. It's not gifts cannot be isolated from the character of God, from the nature of God. Um, it is the power of God, and so it is for everybody. And we saw. Um, you know the uh, well. Well, Paul says in the the way he ends chapter twelve that we pursue the best gifts, um, and then he talks about love. And now today we look at chapter fourteen. Right, we address some things about uh, you know especially that particular question that he asked the rhetoric question, the rhetoric where he says uh, you know do all you know do all prophesy do all you know speak in tongues. Uh, that is uh, end of chapter 12 we we address that question right sufficiently i think um uh, and then he talks about healings speaking with tongues do all interpret etc and then obviously the answer is no but we know why he asked that question because he's talking about ministry appointments in the in the body of christ okay so that is something that we need to be clear about otherwise uh, you know when all these exhortation about seeking the best gift Pursuing love, designing spiritual gifts, all that doesn't seem to make sense if it was for some people and not for all, right? Okay, so uh, we looked at chapter 12, sorry, chapter 13. And th in chapter 13, Paul writes about uh, the importance of love. And uh, he writes it in such a way uh, because he's talking about the love of God, the agape of God, the unconditional love of God. Um, and he says, you know, if we don't have that or express that in our ministering, in our usage of the gifts, then the gifts become the effectiveness of it, or you know, the use of it becomes nil. Right? He says, uh, he says, I am nothing, or it becomes the usage of the gifts become like a sounding, uh, you know, clanging symbol and just noise and so on. So, you know, one thing interesting to note is that he says in verse three. That is chapter 13 and verse 3 says, Though I bestow all my gifts to the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love. So he's talking about martyrdom, right? Uh, sacrifice of one's life, one's belongings, and one's life. And he's saying, you know, if if I don't have this love of God in doing that, and even then, if even if I do that, he says, it profits me nothing. So the motive for generosity, giving, the motive for even sacrificing one's life, even till that extent, right? We like we see, you know, people sacrificing themselves. If you look at some of the radical groups, you know, they are sacrificing. Why? Because they believe in that cause, but it's motivated out of hatred. And why? You know, these people should not be there. They, they should be destroyed. And you know, it's motivated out of uh, hatred. Where, so here it is a lot, lot of saying, you know, if you even if you give your body to be burned, but if you don't have love, then it profits you nothing. So, so the importance of love in the usage of the uh, love and power, if you look at it, you know, the power of God and the love of God going together. Well, the power of God in manifestation, the power of God in expression can be spectacular, can be exciting. Can be, you know, in a way that is, you know, when you put the power of God in, in, in demonstration of the power of God, can be something amazing. But at the same time, it should go with God's heart, the love of God, right, for the edification of people, for the benefit of people, because it is indeed an expression of God's heart, God's love for the people. So, love and power cannot be separated. The love of God and the power of God should not be separated. No, cannot be separated. Okay, so with that, let's look at chapter 14, right? Chapter 14, 
um where we continues about the gifts right so many times when we look at chapter 13 and the end of it where we say you know um faith hope love and the greatest of these is love why does he say that because there's no end to it right prophecy there's an end uh tongues there is an end to it because when we see the lord when we are with him face to face all these don't matter it comes to an end right but the love of god the character of god there is no end to it it is going to continue towards eternity so that is why he says the greatest of these is love right so while that is there that is the truth we need to continue on because he's not done with the subject right so chapter 14 um let's read chapter 14 verses 1 to 5 is pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to god for no one understands him however in the spirit he speaks mysteries but he who prophesies speaks edification exhortation and comfort to men he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself but he who prophesies edifies the church i wish you all spoke with tongues unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification right so continuing on with the subject paul says pursue love and desire spiritual gifts you know pursue love the word that he uses there is agape the unconditional love of god pursue meaning make sure that that is there in your life you know that can be elusive because of your flesh because of your unrenewed mind unrenewed thinking the expression of god's love you know can have barriers you know but saying go after it pursue it pursue love and desire spiritual gifts and he uses a very strong word uh, desire um which means uh, you know you, you can use it uh, in a negative connotation it would mean lust right so he's saying have that strong desire for spiritual gifts right pursue love desire spiritual gifts and especially that you may prophesy and he goes on to explain and the difference between tongues what it does and difference between you know prophecy what prophecy does right and um, so again here we see he's saying desire spiritual gifts meaning plural not just one go after everything go after everything because everything all the gifts are an expression of the holy spirit so desire spiritual gifts okay so and uh, verses 2 and 2 to 4 he, he talks about if i speak in a tongue i speak mysteries i speak to god but i'm not addressing man because man does not understand okay so this whole thing of like people saying that you know if you speak in a tongue if you pray in a tongue it has to be an earthly language right it has to be someone someone should understand in the world is actually not true because you know 13 chapter 13 verse 1 also says that you speak with the tongues of men you speak with the tongues of angels so it could be a heavenly language it could be a earthly language so here also he's saying you know man does not understand because you're speaking to god it's a heavenly language in the spirit you're speaking mysteries right so the hidden things of god yet to be revealed or god wants to reveal that to you maybe your plans your future your um, you know your uh, everything that is connected to your life maybe connected to the lives of others you know certain things that we don't know what we should pray for everything god speaks these mysteries so we speak mysteries to our spirit there's a revelation of it right in our spirit but when you prophesy what happens is there is edification exhortation and comfort to the person who is hearing okay because prophecy by definition is an inspired utterance right you're speaking forth what you hear from god right god speaking to man through man so when the word is released then there is edification which means building up exhortation encouragement and comfort consolation to the person who's listening right he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself there is spiritual uh, edification that happens to a person who is speaking in tongues personally personally you are edified but when you prophesy the others are also edified so he is talking about you know in a public setting again in a church setting when prophecy is more edif- edifying than praying in tongues right but praying in tongues as a personal benefit prophecy has a corporate 
benefit, right? So that is why he says, he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. You know, sometimes that also is taken out of context and saying, hey, prophesying is bet greater than praying in tongues. You know, this is the context. Because it brings edification to people in a public setting, prophesying is greater in bringing benefit, bringing edification, bringing exhortation to man, right? Unless, he also says, he who speaks, unless there is interpretation, when there is interpretation of tongues, it is like prophecy and it brings edification to the church. It builds up the church, okay? So that is why, you know, Paul's saying, you know, pursue love, desire, spiritual gifts, okay? Let's look at uh, verse 6 onwards. Uh, verse 6, he's talking about the public ministry of tongues, okay? Um, this is also we need to. This is something that we need to understand in context because um, it is many times taken out of context and therefore brought in a lot of confusion, right? Even in the charismatic uh, Pentecostal church circles, right? So, verse six. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp. When they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say Amen at the giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Right? Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice, be babes, but in understanding, be mature. Right? So, um, so here we, uh, we understand about the public ministry of tongues. Right? So he's saying, you know, if I speak in a tongue in a public setting, okay, how will it profit the hearer unless there is interpretation, right? Because, or unless he has the hearer, the one who's receiving it, one who's hearing it has interpretation, right? So he's talking about a public ministry or public address or public message of tongues, okay? So if one is going to be do that, going to be doing that, it is not beneficial. So he's talking about, you know, language. If you speak in a language that I don't understand, if I speak in a language you don't understand, it's not going to be beneficial. We might speak for a long time in a language that we don't understand, but it's not in any way going to benefit the hearer. So that is why he's saying, you know, and um, he's using different examples. So um, verse 15 is, you know, crucial where he says that, okay, I will pray with the Spirit, right? So that usage with the Spirit is referring to praying in tongues because here he's still talking about tongues, talking about praying with the known language or understanding. So he's saying, I will pray with the Spirit. And we know that Greek, you know, with, in, of, everything is, is interchangeable. It's the same thing. So we can use... We can say pray in the spirit or pray with the spirit, pray in the understanding. It's the same thing, right? So he's saying, I will pray with the spirit. I will also pray with the understanding, okay? I will sing with the spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. So we know the scriptural validity of all this 
praying in tongues, singing in tongues, and so on, right? Um, and then he also gives a personal revelation. You know, I speak with tongues more than you all, meaning that he spends extended time praying in tongues. So he's not against tongues, but he is definitely, you know, giving the best use of tongues in a public setting if it is an address to the congregation or uh, you know if it is a message to the congregation so verse 6 he says you know if i uh, unless how will it profit the congregation benefit the congregation and he mentions four things if i speak by revelation meaning there's an unveiling of truth if i speak by knowledge spiritual truth to build people up or prophesying by inspiration as inspired by the Holy Spirit or by teaching, right? So getting deeper into the word, explanation of the word and so on. So these four are valid expressions which will benefit the church, revelation, knowledge, prophesying, teaching. Right? So, um, so, so he's saying, you know, you are zealous for spiritual gifts, but in your zeal, also think about how can my zeal for gifts, how can my usage of the gifts benefit the other person? Right? Now, definitely, tongues is going to benefit you personally, but when when you are with others, how it is going to, how will it help? So then he goes on to say, if you are praying in tongues, or if you are going to be speaking in tongues, pray that you may interpret. Right? So. The gathering in in gathering um, in in a public setting, <clears throat> the question is: or no, should we pray in tongues or not? No, that's the thing. Right? Should we pray in tongues? Should we speak in tongues? Uh, and uh, I think we, as we go further in the passage, we see Paul addresses that as also. Also, you know, if you are in a church, if you are with other believers. You know, should we pray out loud in tongues? You know, that's the thing. You no, know? like people say, no, you cannot. If you're with other believers and they're saying you cannot, tongues cannot be spoken out loud in a church in a gathering. Right? There are views, strong views like that, saying you know, you need to, you cannot, if you, unless you're alone. Well, Paul addresses that also. Okay, so he talks about different kinds of tongues and he addresses that also. Right, um, but he ends that. Um, section in verse 19 saying in the church i would rather speak five words rather than 10000 which people don't understand five words which people understand rather than 10000 right so let's look at um, uh, verse 21 onwards right um, 21 22 in the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for believers, but for those who believe. So here he's talking about tongues being a sign for the unbeliever. You know? So we see that in Acts chapter 2, tongues were a sign, right? where people prayed in tongues, and it was a sign for the unbeliever. People who gathered around, they, you know, they had varied reactions to the, the whole thing of praying in tongues. And they say, you know, they we hear them speaking in our own tongues. So there can be uh, a sign. It can be a sign for the unbeliever who does not, you know, who knows that you don't know the language, but then you are speaking their language. So God can use that as a sign for the unbeliever also. But prophecy. We know that brings edification, right? Um, so it's just contrasting that, right? Uh, and what happens uh, on the day of Pentecost? Acts chapter 2 is an example of that. Um, verses 23 onwards. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, okay, will, not, will they not say you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convicted or convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Right? So, um, so we see 
tongues are a sign for the unbeliever but if the, so he's saying you know continuing on with the same thing if the whole church comes together and everybody is praying in tongues the one who is uninformed or an unbeliever does not understand he steps in and sees that everybody's you know speaking in strange tongues and unless there is interpretation or unless it is a sign for the unbeliever he will just say that hey these people are mad right you are out of your mind but if there is prophecy if there is prophecy then what what happens is the secrets of that person's heart are revealed and so there is conviction that person is convinced and so he will fall down on his face he will worship god and report that god is truly among you so saying this can happen in a setting um when everybody comes together and well there is no public expression of tongues but there is definitely public expression of prophecy okay you, you have a question yeah so was this was 22 yeah like the brother and people will use like uh 22 huh? yes yeah tongues for a sign for the unbelie unbelievers uh -huh. not for those who believes mm. so these guys are saying like okay we are believing jesus Christ, that that's the reason like no need to we are believing holy spirit also but the brother foundation is like this okay they won't talk in tongues they won't propose i only teaching mm. that is only thing so yeah. the main the core of that is okay there is for unbelievers so mm. how to talk to them yeah so the thing is we have to take the whole we have to look at 12 to 14 in order to speak because if we take any one of these verses from chapters 12 to 14 out of it by itself we can actually go any direction with it right so here like for example if you look at chapter 13 also you know tongues will fail prophecy will fail so some of them use that also saying hey it will come to an end right it's uh, it's uh, it will fail therefore you know we don't need it right but that also you know it talks about knowledge will also pass away then we should say hey what about knowledge knowledge of the word understanding of the word is that also gone right so <clears throat> that which is perfect is come is referred to as the word of god according to them you know they see it as the word of god that is perfect that has come therefore tongues prophecy you know everything will you know that's passed away but you should you know you should understand that knowledge is also one of those things so uh we cannot take any any one verse out of context uh and then you know build a doctrine around it because he's saying <clears throat> uh i wish you all pray the tongues that is also for the believer but i wish that you all prophesy that is also for the believer then verse 39 in chapter 14 where he says brethren earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues so that is also for the believer so we understand that we need to take the whole thing in context and uh, if they are open then they will understand it but if we are very closed but glon could bring under revelation you know i know of a person who for many years you know he was a pastor for many years completely closed to this idea of tongues baptism of the holy spirit and idea of tongues he was in that denomination <clears throat> but then something happened he came out of it and he was individually you know doing a ministry of counseling and all that then he happened to go for a conference he attended the conference the person in the room next to him was a very good believer he met got to know him and every morning he would be praying aloud in tongues so he could hear hear him and then he heard and he was stirred up and he said lord i see this he's a good believer yeah. and uh, somehow that cost a hunger in him he said lord i if it is what you have for every believer i want it and he prayed god filled the spirit and started praying in tongues so he came back and shared this testimony after some 25 years in ministry 25 probably more you know he was uh, probably in his 60s when he shared he said lord open my eyes but so much of time had gone by <clears throat> but uh, and even in the brethren church i've seen uh, like this this couple who come who came from new zealand who ministered in church and um, even in the brethren church there are people you know who are spirit filled you know 
uh, so they might be part of the brethren denomination. So we have all kinds of believers in all kinds of denominations, but the Lord is bringing understanding. But uh, one needs to be open to it, and it takes time. It takes uh, like from our side also. It takes patience to teach and uh, to to be loving, and then say, okay, this is what it is, and show by demonstration through our own lives. I think that's the greatest message. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, those who are watching online uh, also. Um, yeah, Shira. Yeah, Pastor. Well, uh, talking about thugs, like, sometimes what uh, I also felt is like people speak tongues, just simply they're speaking, right? The words. Yeah. And sometimes I'm feeling like they're speaking just like anything. Mm. Like uh, for, for, uh, during tongues only. Okay. It may be like I felt like this. There's, there's, it's not like a tongues they're speaking. It's something like like, like barbering. It says no. Mm -hmm. uh, anything like they speak, whatever it's uh, come into mind. Like mm -hmm. they speak. I felt sometimes. So how to like uh, felt, uh how to like what to say? Distinguish. Come to the, the, the mm -hmm. place that I felt. Okay, this is tongues. What they speak. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, so we cannot judge that. See, the thing is because. In the early church also, you see that people prayed in tongues and it was, they thought that these are drunk, these are blabbering something. So it was it was like that. So we, we who are hearing cannot judge that, you know. Um, of course, the Lord can give discernment and say, okay, maybe that person is speaking in the flesh, etc. But... Uh, yeah, we cannot discern. We cannot. Uh, I mean, we can be discerning, but we cannot judge and say conclusively hey, this is not of tongues. Or, you know, in my opinion, I'm just saying that that we cannot make that judgment. Actually, um, <clears throat> yeah, because we don't have infinite understanding. There could be anything heavenly language. We don't have understanding earthly language. Also, we don't have full understanding. You know, which part of the world? Where. Like for example, there are some languages. In, in the continent of Africa, some tribes, and the words are like, that's a that's a word, right? So if somebody's praying in tongues and they're using words like, you know, we'll say, you know, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you, you know, making, because that's what we do to make the horses go, <laughs> you know, so we cannot. So the thing is, uh, yeah, though we might feel that, hey, this person is maybe doing something in the flesh, just leave it to God. You know, over time, if their heart is postured towards God, it will change. That will change. And even for us also, you know, personally, we might think, okay, maybe I'm saying some things, especially when you start off, you know, fresh, new. Uh, you might think that, okay, um, am I saying something? Am I saying something? Does it? Is it really tongues? Is it not tongues? Don't worry, just persist. Be faithful, and you know things will change. You have a so this is like in related to this question. Yeah. So like uh, I know like there are two people. One person is like he will pray in tongues, and around the people would start laughing on him. Like sorry, who will who will start laughing? That will be on congregation. Okay. So this person will, like normally will pray in tongues. Okay. When this person starts praying in tongues, other people laugh. Laugh at him? Laugh at him? Huh? Laugh at him. Okay. And he will also will join that. Okay, like that. And another person is like in our church. Okay. So like before I'm coming to like Christ and also this person will pray in tongues. I start make fun of him. Ah, oh, fun of him. Okay. Like, okay, what is he? Like that. So, and my friends also will join that. Mm. So it is a sin or is it blaspheming against Holy Spirit? Like, yeah, it's done in ignorance. See, because we don't have the understanding, we don't have the experience, and then we, you know, uh, blessing of the Holy Spirit is when you know, and then still you attribute it as a work of the devil. So that's what the Pharisees did. That's the difference. We do it in ignorance, and so that's fine. But the first example that you, first thing that you shared is uh, this person is praying in tongues, and uh, you know, are they laughing at him, or is that kind of a joy of the Lord? So they're it's like a work of the spirit, like or fun. fun of him. And this the person who is praying, he will also laugh. He is praying and okay, he will also start laughing. 
I see. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, uh, you know, if you're doing it in ignorance, I mean, it's it's fine. It's uh, I mean, it's fine in the sense that it's not fine, but it's uh, you know, it's something that uh, the Lord will not hold it against you. He'll bring you to a place of uh, you know conviction and knowledge. Um, yeah. So that is what I would uh, <laughs> say. Like we can talk to that people or we can talk to that person. Uh. So like how to avoid this. Mm. Mm. How do we correct that person? Yes. Huh? How do we bring that? Yeah. So maybe we can ask them, you know, why why is it that uh, you know that kind of I think the thing is to you know also look at it. Why is it that when that person speaks like I'm I am i am assuming that he's speaking from a podium, right? In front of others, from a mic or something or Prayer time in the prayer time, okay. So yeah, maybe we should just ask the others also. You know, why are you laughing? He is praying in tongues. So why why are you laughing? Is it because some words are funny, or why is it? And I think uh, I think more than him, the others who are laughing, we need to ask. You know why? And uh, you know, it's not a it's not something to laugh at, but. Uh, you can also join in and pray in tongues as believers as you are praying. I think uh, more than him, it's need to ask the congregation. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so anyway, so so this situation is not new. It is there in the Corinthian church. Like we see that people come in saying, hey, these guys are crazy, you know. But then he says, you know, if you prophesy on the other hand, then you're actually, you know, God is revealing what is in that person's heart, maybe a word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy. Then that person's heart is revealed and he knows that, okay, no one else knows this information. Definitely there is God. And so he comes to that realization that God is among you and he will worship. Right? So he says that. Right? Um, now, when we... When we look at this also, uh, later in uh, verses 26 to 28 and that last part, he talks about how in a public setting, we as believers can continue to pray in tongues. You know, that's a dilemma, right? That's the thing. You know, can all the believers pray in tongues? Can they pray in tongues out loud? So Paul addresses that also, right? So, so then we know that he's talking about a public message in tongues as against believers coming together and personally praying for spiritual edification okay there's a difference right so he is addressing that okay but let's look at um, you know verses 26 onwards um so 26 uh, let me just read out how is it then brethren whenever you come together each of you has a psalm has a teaching has a tongue has a revelation has an interpretation let all things be done for edification if anyone speaks in a tongue let there be two or three at the most, uh, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now, this is very important, right? Then he talks about prophecy, verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged right and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets for god is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints okay so here again a very important truth and a very important guideline about the use of gifts so he's saying okay god distributes to uh, you know, these expressions uh, e among you. So one has a tongue, one has a revelation, one has an interpretation, one has a psalm, teaching, and so on. So he's saying you take turns, let everything be done for edification. Right? About speaking in tongues, two or three at the most, let there be interpretation, which means here you're talking about people who are actually, I'm going to be praying and speaking in tongues, and maybe someone in the congregation or with me, myself, I have the interpretation. Right? So take turns to do that. Otherwise, he's saying, let him keep silent in church. OK, 
okay so now this keeping silent in church how is it is it absolute no speaking in tongues no the second part of it we're looking at verse 28 right let him speak to him, himself and to god so this keep silent in church what he's saying is don't address publicly but you between you and god you continue praying in tongues so there's a group of believers can we pray in tongues between us and god yes right you can but if i take the mic and if i start speaking in tongues let there be interpretation let me take turns to interpret it so that is the that is the understanding right so maybe as a leader i can encourage people to pray in tongues you know like we do during the supernatural hour come on everybody let's pray in tongues so so i can do that i can encourage people and then maybe to encourage i can just start to speak but then i don't speak into the mic into the you know loudly as a message uh, unless there is interpretation so that is something that is very clear here right okay so, yeah yeah uh, there is uh, one more gift we are talking about interpretation right masa but when we see this time we see mostly people they speak in tongues when we pray they feel in the uh, in the holy spirit, holy spirit and they speak tongues yeah wherever we go we found that but uh, we see very less even very less means very less interpretations are there so like what's the leg between like why like oh, speaking tongues is very much everywhere will found fine but uh, interpretation is almost not right no so so there is something that we as a church need to step into you know i've seen interpretation in tongues where a person this is a person who actually prays a lot and uh, i mean who has the gift of intercession and so on so when she is prays she prays one line in tongues she prays the interpretation so speaks one line and speaks the interpretation i've seen it in operation this whole thing of one person like let's say you pray and then you know the lord giving the interpretation to another person and then speaking out that we've not that i've i've not personally seen but i'm sure that is there in the churches also and that also needs to be facilitated well so that it is done well there is no confusion and it's uh, it's done orderly but that is also something that we need to press into you know just like prophecy or healing or any other gifts this is also something that we need to intentionally step in and we can intentionally step in personally for ourselves right where we where we you know it's a risk it's a step of faith how do you prophesy you prophesy when there is a impression when there is a knowing when there is a picture when there is you know scripture that is quickened you prophesy right same with interpretation of tongues right so when somebody is praying maybe speaking a message in tongues or you yourself you you know and then you you ask the lord lord he says you know let him who speaks in tongues pray for an interpretation you ask the lord and say god you know just give me an interpretation and perceive in the spirit you know lord what is it that you're showing me so that's something that we need to step into yeah, yeah. so like in uh, the nine gifts we can see like every gifts are every day's life sorry every uh, gifts the huh? gifts are there right so we can see like uh, every gifts are manifestations like tongues healing prophetic prophet everything is like we can see daily life from someone some pastor is doing like this but when it's come to interpretations it's like very like uh, less so why like uh, my question is like why What? all gifts are uh, we can see manifestations mm. but why we cannot see this uh, interpretations yeah i think um... this is just my understanding see i come from a uh, church background which is totally all this is foreign <laughs> okay like prophecy everything is like somewhere it is like okay old testament no mention of it so for me when i encountered this this is like hey this is new like so same way i feel the lord is restoring these gifts back to the body is restoring just like the fivefold ministry uh, this understanding revelation of the gifts back to the body but the church as a body of christ we have not actively stepped in to this right like if you go to a csi church you don't see that you know i was there last uh, in a you know in a csi church i was i had taken my mother in law and 
I was there just listening to the meeting and everything uh, last week. But I see that, okay, these, these are some things which are not mentioned. These are th some things which are not there, right? Um, but that means that it is there in scripture and we need to intentionally step in, right? And maybe in our understanding, in our you know, experience, we have not seen it, but I've heard of churches, these are you know, small churches, where this is functional, interpretation is functional, right? I've seen in small gatherings where this is functional. So this is something that we need to, the best way is for us personally, maybe you're spending you know, one hour praying in tongues personally, just step in, you know, after that praying in tongues, just take that step of faith and say, okay, God, you know, you give me the interpretation. So you pray out and what the Lord puts in your heart, in your known language, whether it's Hindi or whatever, you speak that out. That's the best way to practice interpretation. And so, yeah. Okay. Uh, Master, I commend you that uh, um, South Indian Pentecostal churches. So, <laughs> okay. They're like, they're not, it's not like praying in tongues, they're worshipping in tongues. Like, mm. after a song, they will spend some time. Yes, so, like, but the people make. But, but everybody is praying. Uh, everybody is uh, praying in tongues. Everybody praying in tongues, yeah. but it's not like, okay, not only praying, is the song how it went. After that, inside of the worship only, on that will, that flow, they will pray in tongues. Okay. So coming, but there we can we can't see much interpretation. Okay. But everybody are praying in tongues. Yeah. So is it like against the biblical or? But the people are fully confused. But outside people are fully confused what's happening there. Mm. There is no interpretation. So people can pray like that. Yeah. So the thing is, it's it's very edifying. It's very refreshing. Like for the entire church. So when, when we gather as believers, let's say, you know, supernatural, you know, when we pray in tongues, when we sing in tongues, when we worship in tongues, it's so powerful. It's spiritually very edifying. And that is something that we need to do. But in a church gathering, we need to be mindful, okay. Uh, can, can I do this uh, if there are new people who are, who are not yet uh, believers, who are considering Christ, can I do this? Will I put them off? Will I, will it be, you know? So it's a fine line. So we need to think. Now, I also know that South Indian Pentecostal churches, not many people go there just to see what is happening. It's families, generation of families who come, who are born into the Pentecostal, whatever church, family, next generation, they go. but. I, I won't see any, uh, let's say, a Hindu or a Muslim or a thing saying, okay, here's a church, I have a need, let me go on a Sunday morning. I don't see that happening, right? So, whereas in any other church, they might step in and see uh, what are they saying, what are they, you know. So, so those are some things that we need to, so it, you become very inclusive and it's fine, you know, this is, this is helpful for the congregation, but Paul is talking about Will it really, you know, help someone who comes in who does not know these truths, who does not know Christ, and will it be helpful? So that's a decision that we need to make. You know, we can have prayer meetings, we can have, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and if our church Sunday meeting is going to be only believers, it might perfect sense to do this. But if it is going to be you're inviting people to consider Christ, and you're, you know, then it may not be helpful. So that's the thing. So, yeah. It's a good thought. Yeah. But we should not give up that. See, sometimes what happens is, okay, no public speaking, no, you know, people are gathered together, no tongues at all. Now that's going the other extreme. Right? Because Paul says in verse 28 very clearly, let him speak to himself and to God. So let there be tongues. There is benefit, even as a corporate body. But you speak to God, and there is, you know, there's benefit in that. Yeah. Okay. So these are some. Um, okay, let me see online. Any questions? Nothing at all.
Okay, uh, there's a, how can we perceive the balance between personal spiritual experience and communal edification? Hmm. Perceive the balance in the sense. Um, um, see, even in a, in a corporate time, there is personal edification happening. But, uh, you know, the, the balance is this, being sensitive. So that's the balance, or I would like to call it the wholesomeness, right? Uh, being sensitive, is it for the edification? Because Paul is very clear, and he's saying, you are zealous for spiritual gifts, but let it be for the edification of this church that you seek to excel. So is it edif edifying everyone? So that is also scriptural. Yes, I want to be personally zealous, hungry for God, more of God, more of His gifts. I don't want to compromise on that. Right? At the same time, we should also, with the same zeal, think of, is the church, is the body being edified? Is everyone being benefited? Because that was the issue in the Corinthian church. That was the problem that he's addressing. I hope that helps, Chaya. Right? Okay, we'll take a break and we'll come back and um, continue after the break. Thanks.